talk about the design and the construction of Illinois' first precast back panel bridge with a UHPC joint. The UHPC represents the ultra-high performance concrete. Uh, when we designed this bridge a couple years ago, only a few DOGs used this new deck system. They were New York, Montana, Oregon, and the Utah. When New York State DOT used this new deck system for more than 20 bridges in the last couple of years because this new deck system allows them to replace the existing deck or build a new deck in just three to five days. Therefore, I believe this new deck system could be a good option for future deck replacement in urban area or for routes with highway traffic volume. Here's the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction of our precast deck panels. Then I will present three approaches to provide the continuity at the panel joint. I will talk about superior mechanical properties of the UHPC. Finally, I will present Pure Street Bridge, which is a $450 million circling the change project in downtown Chicago. First, I'd like to show you some construction photos from the New York State DOT project, just for those of you who are not familiar with new deck system. This picture shows they were erecting the deck panels. You can see the bridge parapet uh, is cast with the precast deck panels to speed up construction. Also, they were using the closed uh, shear strut pocket in for this bridge to speed up, uh, speed up construction. You can see the top of the shear strut is below the bottom layer of the steel of the precast deck panels. Here's the deck panel layout before they cast the longitudinal joints and the transverse UHPC joints. Uh, this picture shows the exposed aggregate surface for the precast deck panels, which is very critical to provide a good bounding between the panels and the UHPC. And after they grind the UHPC joints, and the precast deck panels by about half inches, the, uh, the bridge was open to traffic. You can see there's a different color between the precast deck panel and the UHPC joints. Per FHWA's website, full depth precast deck panel is the most popular ADC system. They speed up construction. They increase the quality of the concrete members by fabricating the precast members in a controlled environment. They increase the construction safety by avoiding forming rebar placement, concrete placement, and the curing at the bridge site. But I think the most benefit is the user convenience. But sometimes it's very difficult uh, to quantify the cost savings. Here's a brief history of uh, four depth precast deck panels. The first precast deck panel bridge with the internal post tensioning was built in 1965. Illinois DOT built the first deck panel bridge with the internal post tensioning in 2000. As of today, over 70 projects in US have used the precast deck panels. So we all know each structural system has its limitations. So what are the negatives for precast deck panels? Uh, first, the construction cost is very high. The design is a complex. Precast deck panel with internal post tensioning require much more design efforts than cast in place deck. The construction is complex. That's just the nature of the uh, precast construction. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention the. I mean, the four precast deck panel with the UHPC joints. Uh, you do not have an article uh, design specifications to tell you how to design or detail the USPC joints, so you pretty much rely on the research and the testing data to detail the joints. Uh, the joint performance is always concerned to the owners. Now I'm going to talk about these three approaches to provide a continuity to the panel joints. The first conventional approach is internal post tensioning. The second approach is called Excel bridge system. The third one is the USPC. Precast deck panels with internal post tensioning bridge, uh, they have been performing pretty well in the past, uh, but they require transverse closure core at the abutments to 
protect the PT anchorage for wider bridge longitudinal closure pull is required. The cracking in the joint could cause potential post-tensioning corrosion. The axial bridge system was invented by Eddie He. The principle of the axial bridge system is to introduce the compression by jacking or external post-tensioning. The first bridge using axial bridge system is under construction in Louisiana. This diagram shows the jacking concept. The construction sequence is a, first you place all the panels, stack panels on the, the beams, then you make this these two end panels composite with beams, then you apply the jacking force here to create the compression force into the back panel. This diagram shows the post-tensioning, external post-tensioning concept. Uh, the green line is the profile of post-tensioning. After you apply the post-tensioning, you will create a compression force into the back panel. UHPC joints do not require post-tensioning. They require less construction time than internal post-tensioning and the axial bridge system. UHPC is a very structural and durable material. The negative is the unit price is very high. In Illinois POT, well, the reason they choose this UHPC joint is, uh, is because it's a new uh, material, new technology. If you want to gain the construction uh, experience, you have to test it. Here is uh, just a brief history of a UHPC. The research on UHPC started in France in early 1990s. The first UHPC bridge was built in Quebec in 1997. U.S. started its commercial use in 2000. The first precast pre-stress UHPC beam bridge was built in Iowa in 2006. The first precast back panel bridge with the UHPC joints was built in New York in 2009. Now I'm going to talk about UHPC's superior mechanical properties. UHPC is a reinforced fiber steel concrete. They can reach 21 to 29 KSI compressive strength in 28 days, 12 KSI in just 12 hours, which allows New York State DOT to replace some of their bridges in a single weekend. Here's the tensile stress strain curve of the UHVC. You can see the, po the post-cracking behavior is almost plastic, which means that Steel fibers can arrest the cracks and the prevent the crack propagation. As opposed to conventional concrete after initial cracking, you will experience the very steep strain softening. USPC is a very ductile material. The right hand side picture shows after very, this is like a one and a half inch thick USPC slab and no reinforcement. You can see the slabs, UHPC slabs, can still take a very large, after very large uh, deflection. This, the curve shows the flexural capacity of the UHPC is about eight times higher than the conventional concrete. UHPC is a very durable material. The bottom right-hand side photo shows after 500 freeze-thaw cycles and the 4,500 wet dry cycles in a saturated seawater UHPC specimen are still in good shape. This curve shows the chloride penetration uh, for the conventional concrete in 100 years is about about 2 inches as opposed to just the 1 inch for the UHPC. The UHPC joint detail is pretty much based on the pull out the test. Uh, New York State DOT conducted uh, this pull out test uh, quite a few years ago. They used only four inch embedment for number five bars and the five inch embedment for number six bars. And the all pull out test shows the rebar ruptures before pulling out, which indicates there's a very strong bonding between UHPC and the rebar. The T test was performed on UHVC joints. Uh, you can see here after five million cycles, there's no leakage through the joints. Static test 
was also performed on the USB-C joints and the results are very positive. Now I'm going to talk about PR Street Bridge, which is Illinois' first precast panel bridge with a USB-C joint. It's a pedestrian bridge, uh, but we designed for the highway traffic as well, just in case if they want to convert the pedestrian bridge into a highway bridge later on. Yeah, what you see here is the project location. Here is the circle in the change. It's the one of the top 10 worst uh, interchange in US. Pierre Street is located on the west side of the project. Here's uh, some highlights of the $450 million circle in the change project. There are 22 existing bridges, 18 new bridges, Seven curved steel girder bridge. One curved steel girder bridge has a, a radius of 220 feet, so it's more like a circle. We have 49 retaining walls. To reduce the future maintenance cost, we use a galvanized steel plate girder for all the straight girder uh, for all the straight bridges, and a mechanized steel plate girder for all the curved uh, girder bridges. To you. To reduce the noise and the vibration, we use the drill shaft and the micro piles for all the foundations. Here's the picture of the circle interchange before the construction was started. And here's the rendering uh, of the circle interchange when the project is complete. Pure Street Bridge is a three-span galvanized steel plate bridge. The bridge is uh, 273 feet long, 56 feet wide. We have a uh, 52 precast deck panels. We use a transverse and the longitudinal UHPC joint. And uh, here's the layout of uh, precast deck panels. We have uh, more than 20 different types of uh, precast deck panels due to the complex geometry of the bridge. We have a uh, drainage scuppers on the on the deck, and also we have a light pole pump power. And also we have a CTA train station connected to the west side of the bridge, a staircase uh, connected to the east side of the bridge. And here's the close view of the deck panel layout. Uh, these are the transverse UHPC joints. Uh, this is the longitudinal UHPC joint. The, these dots represent the shear stop pocket. Here's the typical section of the bridge. We have a lot of utilities carried by the bridge. We use a preset utility inserts um, into the deck panels to prevent the steel drilling. We also use a, a latex concrete overlay with a scoring joint to meet the aesthetic requirement. What you see here is the UHPC transverse joints. During the shock joint review, we use a six inch lap rebar, uh, rebar lap lens for number six bars and a five inch. Uh, left lens for no, uh, number five bars. Here is the longitudinal UHPC joint. And we will use a little bit larger opening to accommodate the shear stub. Here is the shear stub pocket. Uh, will be uh, was filled with a long shrink grout. To reduce or to eliminate the expansion joints and uh, reduce the future maintenance cost, and we use a semi-integral abutment on tall wall, which is not very typical. Now I'm going to show you some construction photos for this project. What you see here is the, um, in the fabrication shop, they were placing the rebars for the deck panels. The virtual rebars are for the bridge pyramid. And here's the light pole bump out. It looks like it uh, requires lots of space to store the deck panels. For some reason, we ship the one panel per truck. Um, the fabrication site is about over two hours away. They were lowering the deck panels into place. The use of fiberglass forms at the transverse joint. And uh, here you can see this. These are like exposed aggregate surface. Uh, these are the they call the EVA compressible material foam for the hunch. 
And uh, after they place all the set all the deck panels in place, then they use this as uh, they call the leveling bolt to adjust the panel height to meet the profile requirement. Here's the transverse and the longitudinal USB C joint. Uh, shear stop pocket. Now this is what they call the open shear stop pocket. Uh, the one the photo I show for New York State DOT project, that one they were using the closed form shear stop pocket. Casting the non-shrink grub and uh, mixing the USPC. Casting the USPC along the joint. So you can see USPC is a very flowable material which I mean, could cause a uh, leaking through the form. And uh, they block out the transverse UHVC joint so they can come back next day to finish the transverse UHVC joint. They use the form on top of the UHVC joint to prevent dehydration and uh, to prevent the uh, uplift force for every. 12 inches long UHPC joint, there's about like a 50 pound uplift force. And uh, what you see here is after remove the form, it looks pretty rough, but we don't care because we are going to cast the overlay on top. And, uh, here's the view of the bottom UHPC. It's pretty, the UHPC looks pretty dark. Now here's the picture uh, before the overlay. And uh, after they cast the USB uh, cast overlay, then the bridge was open to the traffic. So for every new structural system, we always have a lot of lesson learned through construction. I wish we could write a special provision to prevent the contractor to submit a V proposal for casting place deck, even though we have a a note on our bridge plans that says the casting place deck uh, is not allowed for some reason. They still went ahead and submitted the proposal. It took either almost 30 days to reject it, still based on our note on the bridge plans. And the A plus bidding, which means the price and the schedule, could speed up the construction. Uh, for some reason, non shrink grub uh, still shrinks in some of the stuff pockets, so maybe epoxy grout is a better option. We don't know. As I mentioned before, the fluorboard UHPC, I mean, it's very easy to go through the, the forms. So I think that, well, from what I heard, most of UHPC for a project, they always have a leaking problem. And the special provision for precast the panel and the UHPC needs to be improved. For some reason, the contract submitted like a nine-year-old UHPC testing data. Uh, I think uh, after we had a meeting with the FHWA, it seems uh, a bit too long. So maybe we should uh, ask them to show the testing data within five years. Um, provide a mock-up for pre cast deck panel, I think it's very critical. So you can check whether they meet the, the requirement for the exposed aggregate surface. Here's just a recap of my um, deck panel presentation. Uh, you can see UHPC has a very high compressive strength, greater than 21 psi. UHPC is a very dark and durable material. They require less construction time then the internal post tensioning and the Excel bridge system, uh, the nectar is a higher unit price. Since we have a little bit more time, I'm going to show you some uh, UHPC's other applications. What you see here is a deck bulb T bin with a UHPC joint. Deck bulb T bin typically has a very wide top flange ranging from like four feet to eight feet. So you can see the top of the flange is acting as a deck. So I think in the past 
there's always performance issue along these uh, longitudinal joints because uh, I mean they only can prevent the differential deflection but they cannot transfer the shear in the moment but with UHPC you can transfer the shear in the moment so that will um, increase the lifespan of these uh, longitudinal joints. Here's a picture that shows the double, teen, uh, double T beam bridge with the UHPC joint. I think in New England they also call the neck beam. I think the limitation is a, is a, this is a pretty heavy thing. I think the span length uh, typically is limited to maybe 80 feet or 100 feet. This is the, I believe it's the US first adjacent box beam with a USPC joint bridge. What you see here is the steel beam module with a USPC joint concept. Um, what you see here is that for each module, you have a two steel beams, and then you can cast the module off the bridge side, then you ship back to the bridge, right? And then then you uh, use the USB-C to connect these modules. I believe I was uh, used this concept a couple of years ago. I think later on, Iowa DOT told me one contractor uh, liked this idea. They even proposed to use this uh, COB module for uh, their project to just to reduce the construction cost and uh, reduce the con construction time. This is the uh, UHPC overlay. Uh, I believe they built this bridge last year. It's a, the first is a, uh, of its application U, uh, in US, but it's a small bridge. And this picture shows the UHPC overlay for a project in Switzerland. You can see they use a UHPC in a very, very large quantity. This is a very long viaduct, and uh, I believe they make this a UHPC overlay composite composite with this uh, post uh, with this post tensioning box girder so they can enhance the uh, the structure capacity. And uh, what you see here is the UHPC link slab. I think New York State DOT use a UHPC link slab a lot. This is for the case when you, in the old days, they, I mean, they have extension joints, then they use steel beam, I mean, simply supported steel beam over the piers. So, so in order to eliminate the extension joints and that provide a continuity, so, so this is a good situation to use the UHBC link slab because you can make this link slab much narrower as opposed to conventional concrete link slab, then you have to make this slab much wider. Here is the situation when the columns are still in good shape, but the pier cap uh, needs to be replaced. Uh, this could happen when you have an expansion joint on top. And uh, the good thing with the UHBC is that you can only need to cut to remove the top of the like a, about one foot of the top of the column, so you can, because the lap length for UHPC, uh, for the three bar with the UHPC is very small, like a, for number A bar, so it's eight inches as opposed to like four or five feet for conventional concrete. Well, that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, we have a few questions that came in. Um, the first set of questions are such as, um, this question was raised in the beginning of your um, discussion. Uh, you know, why is it complex to design? And also the second question we have is, can this system be used on the precast or the pre-strand eye girders? Um, because the most graphics you showed are, you know, the systems are used for the steel girders. Yeah, the first first question is, uh, uh, well, the design is complex. I think uh, 
not it's not really true for precast stack panel with a UHPC joint, just a little bit more kind of liability thing to the owner and the designer because you do not have an article design specifications to tell you how to design or detail the USPC joint. You pretty much just rely on the the research and the testing data. So so definitely there's a liability out there. And the first bridge in US, I mean with this new DEX system was built like only six, seven years ago. So the long term performance uh, needs to be seen. Uh, yes, this system can be used for precast and prescast eye girders. Uh, you are right. I mean, so far most, uh, I mean, application uh, for the steel beams, steel girders, uh, but they do have some project uh, used for precast, prescast eye beams. I think, uh, I think uh, everything pretty much the same. Just the uh, how to make the composite action uh, with the deck panels uh, from the for the precast precast eye girders. I think you have to use it. I mean, uh, different options you can use. Uh, I mean, put a steel plate embedded on top of the precast eye beam. Then you create some like a shear set pocket. Well, this we question. Have, what, sorry. No, sorry. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. The the next next question is uh, what was the maximum hunch height in my design? Uh, in our case, it's uh, it's about the maximum hunch is about like a two inches. In our case, uh, I believe in uh, New York State DOT they use a much higher hunches because. Uh, I think that they use a closed the shear stud pocket, so they, they the top of the shear stud is uh, they place it below the bottom layer of the seal of the deck panels. Um, yeah, I think in our case, uh, I mean there are some leakings when they cast the UHPC. I think that they have because the problem for our case is our girder is pretty shallow. The web depth is only 30 inches, so they have to send a very small guy uh, going down air, uh, there to check the leaking. Uh, definitely it's kind of uh, delayed the casting of the UHPC a little bit. Yeah, pushing the EVA foam out of space, you are right. I mean, I think it, before, they, before the construction, they send us a, a sample of uh, EVA foam, which is much firm, uh, hard, harder. But uh, during the construction, somehow they switch to much softer uh, EVA foam. So you are right. They in some locations they kind of because the the panel is pretty heavy, so they kind of squeeze out in some places. That they cause, I mean, the leaking. Uh, but I think one thing I like to point out is uh, I think that I, I forgot to mention in the lesson learned. I think uh, for this bridge, we use, use like a 14 inch wide top flange. I wish we could use like a 16 knot minimum uh, flange. With that, could, then they can place uh, like a wider EVA foam to mitigate uh, the leaking problem. Uh, the next question is uh, what factors led you to select to galvanize the steel girders over weathering steel? Uh, I think that's just DOT's preference. I think uh, um, I know in Iowa, Iowa DOT use uh, weather steel for most of their steel bridges. Uh, in, in Illinois, they do use some weather and steel, but most times uh, they prefer to use, uh, I mean, most times they still like to, I mean, use the painted steel girder. This is the First project in such a large scale, they use a galvanized steel girder because the Ida District One in Chicago, they, because this is the high, the traffic volume is so high in frequent change, it's about like a, a hundred thousand vehicles per day, so they just don't want to go back to to paint the bridge. So that's why they 
uh, they decide to use a galvanized steel girder for straight bridges and a metallized girder for the uh, curved girder bridges. The next question, was there any challenges during construction related to panel shield tolerance or tolerance build up as the panels were placed? How did you overcome these challenges? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, for every ABC construction or any type of the precast member construction, I think uh, it's all about the measurement. So I kind of talk to the contractor. I mean, many, many, in many, many, I mean, occasions, just tell them it's all about measurements, measurements, measurements. So, so they did lots of work before they cast the deck panel. So they kind of like, a, I mean, check everything many, many times. So to make sure everything fits when they lower down the deck panel. So there's no conflict between the shear studs and the rebars and the deck panels. I mean, I mean, we were pretty lucky there's n any issues. I mean, when they erecting uh, the deck, deck panels, everything is perfect fit. So, so I think a, a good contractor is a very important. Are there any other questions? Yes, we do. We actually have <laughs> quite a few more, but since we have a lot of time uh, left, um, I think we can fully answer all of the questions. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay, this one. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this question is: uh, What it is the cure time for UHPC joints, and when can traffic be placed on the bridge? Yeah, this is a good question. There are. I think right now, uh, well, there's only one vendor, USBC vendor in North America, which is a Lafarge Doctor, they make two different types of a UHPC. Uh, the one we use is called a JS1000. That one requires about like a four days uh, curing time to reach like a 14.5 KSI we specify in our special provision. Then you can open to traffic because you don't have to reach 21 KSI um, concrete strength before you open traffic. Because the reason is that most testing are based on 14 KSI USPC. The next one is why did you use a non string grout for longitudinal joints at the shear set? Why not use a UHPC at all joints? Yeah, the reason is that we just try to reduce the, the construction cost because the UHPC is a very expensive material. That's why uh, we just try to limit the quantity of the UHPC for for this project. For New York State DOT, uh, they have to use a UHPC along. I mean, for all. I mean, for all the closed shear cell pockets and also uh, at the haunches. The reason is that I think that the, that the research shows. You don't have to project the shear studs into the deck slab like a two inches uh, to make the composite action between the girder and the, the deck panels. So that's why, in their case, they have to use a UHPC. How effective were the leveling bolts? Yeah, for this project, they are pretty e effective. I think that. Just the sequence. I think at the very beginning, the contractor they place one, they set up one panel, then they use the leveling bolts to adjust the panel height, which was very time consuming. So late, later on, then they just, I mean, place all the deck panels once, then they go back to use the leveling bolts to adjust the panel height. I think uh, there's no big issues. I mean, when they place the overlay, uh, I think uh, it's pretty much right on the thickness of the overlay pretty much uh, right on the money. Let me see. Did the contractor have a means of determining the low sharing between the bolts for given panels to ensure the panel was unevenly loaded on the girders?
Yeah, I don't think they run any calculations. I think we pretty much just, uh, I mean, in our bridge plans, we show the locations. But in the shop drawings, they kind of run some design to make sure the panel can take the loads during the erection. The girders, yeah, we don't have a, any uneven loaded the girder. I mean, there are some, of course, the loading distribution is a, a little bit different when you have a longitudinal U3C joint. So in that case, at the very beginning, the contractor worry about there's a too much, I mean, differential deflection between those adjacent girders. But I think we ran some chaos and then we found out, that, I mean, the loads are different, but uh, I think that the girder, for some reason, they are rich enough to, I mean, to make it work so we don't have any problem during the erection. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Just a few more. Uh, yeah, three more. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, near the beginning, you show a slide where the shear stuff did not extend it up into the joints between the deck panels. Does this detail rely on the USPC to transfer shear from the deck to the girders, or is this some other mechanics working here? Uh, I think that this detail is based on the, the research test done by FHWA. They have conducted quite a few testing to show even though the shear stars did not like project into like a, the deck panel minimum two inches as required by OSTO, they still can transfer the shear force from deck panel. I think it's kind of there's a very strong bonding between the between the interface surface at the deck panel and the USPC. That's why they can transfer all the shear force from the deck panel to the shear stud, then to the girders. Do you see this as a viable solution for replace post-tensioning PC deck panels? Yeah, I think this this one is pretty tricky. I think uh, uh, I think it all depends on your design and the, your construction sequence. So if you design this thing, the deck as part of, I mean, your design, then then could be a problem. Kind of like a rise pre-stress concrete girder. I mean, when they apply the post tensioning, I mean, it's all about your design. If your design shows it's okay to replace the, the casting casting in place deck with the precast deck panel, then it should be, I think it should be okay. But it hasn't done this yet. So, are there any other questions? Okay. Just two. How did you verify? <laughs> yeah. Okay. How did you verify that distribution of the PDP weight to each girder was assumed in the design? Um, if something is not clear, uh, we can we can move on. Yeah, yeah. I think this one. I think. Uh, I think that we. Well, I think it's, it's all about doing the construction. So during the construction, the weight distribution could be a little bit different. But once they are composite with girder, so we don't care about uneven I mean, distribution uh, between the deck panels. So they pretty much, I mean, just like a regular casting place deck. So just during the construction, we have to run some numbers to make sure, I mean, the girders, one, not one girder, deflect too much uh, and then may cause some uh, fitting problems. The next question is uh, how thick was the overlay that was placed on the back panels? Uh, for this project, we use a two and a, a quarter inch minimum uh, latex concrete overlay. Was a 
Okay. The next question was, was is, is sufficient to deal with any height difference between stack panels? Yeah, I think in our situation, it's because of the overlay and uh, we don't have any problems. And also, I mean, the contractor did a pretty good job. I mean, when they, the thing is they ran lots of tests to make sure, I mean, the haunch height, which is very critical, I mean, along the girders. So just make sure, I mean, uh, you can adjust those differentials to those haunch height, make sure. I mean, of course, there's a problem. So I think I now start with specify like a quarter inch difference between the stack panel adjacent stack panels. So I don't see. Yeah, in our case, I, I we don't have any big problems. Oh, okay. That was the end of the questions. Um, we are going to uh, wrap up the presentation here today. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I think we had very um, technical and in-depth questions thrown. <laughs> thank you, David, yeah. for answering all of them. And everyone, thank you for your time. And we will look forward to uh, meeting you again in the next seminar. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Appreciate it.